Good morning. All right, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just excited to be able to share some stuff with you this morning. Um, before we get into anything, uh, Pastor Chad, you can be praying for him and his family. They are in California this weekend at a funeral, and their family is just kind of um, taking a pretty big hit, suffered a pretty big loss. And so without sharing any details, just want to invite you to be praying for their family as they walk through this process of grief. Um, and that's what we do as a family. We come alongside each other as we grieve, and, um, and, and prayer is powerful. So please do be praying for them. I, uh, I just want to give a special shout out this morning to those of you in traditions, those who are streaming at uh, Houston, Winona, and Wabashaw County Jails, Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge. We're so glad that we can all be together this morning and just share in God's word. Um, now, I'm sure you have never done this, but uh, other people you know have probably done this. Uh, but have, have you or, or maybe just somebody you know, you've seen a ch maybe you've seen a child having a total meltdown in the middle of the grocery store. And now, again, I know you've never done this, but probably somebody you know has judged the parent of that child and been like, oh man, if the child acts like this, what is the parenting like, you know? Or it's just like, they're just kind of dragging them along and you're just like, mm-mm, you know? Um, <clears throat> and so I'm sure you've never done that, but, but a lot of times uh, we judge parents based on their children's behavior. Or as a parent, you've probably felt judged because of your children's behavior. Uh, and for those of you who are parents, you know that it's not always that simple, right? Because kids are just crazy sometimes. Um, and I think what I, what I hear, again, I'm not, I'm not a parent. I've been a kid before. I have parents. Um, but uh, what I hear is that when you're a parent, you become very convinced of the fallen nature of humankind uh, because your, ki your kids are sinners, you know, you didn't have to teach them how to do it, right? They just, they just automatically do horrible things. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of times, we, as, as parents, you maybe can feel judged by that. Uh, so what I did is I called my mom and I asked her, can you think of a time uh, where you were just embarrassed to be my mom? <laughs> and um, unfortunately, she thought of something really quickly. <laughs> and and uh, basically, there was this time we were at a graduation party. I, rem I totally remember this. Um, and we were at this graduation party, and this girl, this other girl who was like in our church and stuff, was just bugging me. And I happened to have a big plastic wiffle bat in my hand. <laughs> so I didn't hit her in the face, okay? I just swatted her leg, okay? So it wasn't that bad uh, in my mind, I guess, at the time. But I swatted her with this wiffle bat, and the, the horrible thing about wiffle bats is, I mean, it was good because it didn't cause a lot of damage, but the horrible thing about wiffle bats is they're super loud. And so I whack her on the leg, and there's just this reverberating like, Pum! and everybody sitting outside of this grad party just stops and looks at me, looks at my parents, looks at me and my mom just told me she was just so embarrassed and wanted to be like, he's not usually like this. Um, but uh, a lot of times, right, kids are seen to be a reflection of their parents. And it's not always the truth, right? You might be an amazing parent and your kids still have, all, have meltdowns and throw stuff and hit people with wiffle bats. But what, what we're going to look at this morning is how kids reflect on their parents and how all that kind of works in the family dynamic. So <clears throat> uh, we've been working through a series on, on, on Timothy, and uh, the verse that really has given us a lot of context for what we've been looking at is 1 Timothy 3.15. And it's where Paul just straight up tells Timothy why he's writing this letter. He says, if I delay you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress, right? Funny word of truth. And now uh, when I read this verse, 
I, I kind of, I, I hear it with a little bit of attitude, right? Like, this is how you behave in God's household, right? And this is, but this is what Paul wants Timothy to know, that he's like, Timothy, right? Timothy was a young pastor of a church in Ephesus. He says, Timothy, the messy people, this messy group of people that you are called to lead, that is your family, the, this is the household of God, that we are God's family. And, and this is the thing that I want us to, to, to grasp right away this morning, is that the church isn't like a family. The church is a family. The church is a family. And no, we might not be blood-related, but we're related by the blood of Jesus, and we might not be DNA-related, but we have the same spiritual DNA through the Holy Spirit. And so we are a family, and actually in a much deeper and more significant way than we even are to our immediate families. And so this statement about the church being family may sound weird to some of us because we don't always do this well in the church. We don't always act like we are a true family because life is messy and situations are complicated. And like we talked about, just not only kids are sinners, right? We're all messed up. And so we don't always do this well. And some of us haven't had a great experience with our immediate earthly family. And so we kind of come into church like, why would I want another family? The one I have is already horrible. <laughs> and the reality is that this isn't a family that's based off of familial love and simple like blood relation. This is a family that's based on the unconditional agape love of God. It's so much more significant and so much more grounded and has such a, a deeper foundation than even our immediate families or our earthly families have. And so, so that's, that's kind of part number one to everything we're going to look at today is that we are a family. Part number two is that also when God made a way for us to join his family, he also gave us the privilege and the responsibility of being his ambassadors. So just like kids reflect their parents, God has given us the responsibility and privilege to reflect him. See, the church collectively is called to show the world what Jesus is like. We are supposed to show the world what Jesus is like. See, this is why the reputation of believers and of a church body in a community is extremely important. Because what they see in you, the way they see you behave, why Paul is writing this letter about behavior. Because again, behavior is something, even to me, it's kind of a weird thing. It's like, in, in, especially here at Pleasant Valley, we want to get past the behavior because behavior is always a result of our belief, right? But our behavior is extremely important because what we do communicates what's inside. Everybody innately understands that. That's why when people see Christians behaving in a certain way, they make inferences about what you believe and what God is like. And so what do the people around you and what do the people around us as a church see in us and what does that communicate about God? Just, I mean, just for example, like, are we generous or are we stingy? Are we gossipers or are we encouragers? Are we repentant or are we arrogant? Are we kind or are we harsh? Just as kids are seen to reflect their parents, Christians and the church are, are reflecting God to the world. True or not, right? Just because a kid behaves that way doesn't mean it's their parents. It, it maybe doesn't even say anything about their parents' parenting style or anything about their parents. It could just be they're having a meltdown. But the world judges God based on our behavior. And we should take that very seriously. So let's jump into 1 Timothy 5 and see how God would have us behave as a family. And again, under your seats, you got Bibles on the screen, on your phone, whatever you want to do to follow along. 
But we're just going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 5, working through that. So, in 1 Timothy 3, Paul talks about we are the household of God. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, he says to Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters in all purity. So again, Paul is coming back to this point that he wants to make sure that Timothy doesn't forget. He's like, I know we're talking about a lot of kind of logistical stuff. I'm trying to train you on how to lead a church, right? But I do not want you to forget, Timothy, that this is your family. You can't start treating this like a business. You can't just start firing people and excommunicating people because you don't like them. This is your family. In some ways, you have to learn how to deal with it. And so <clears throat> this is the foundation for all the rest of the stuff that we're going to look at. And Paul is going to give Timothy some instruction on how to handle specific situations that were happening in the Ephesian church. And so what, what we're going to do today is kind of look at these very specific instructions that Paul is giving to Timothy and sort of zoom out as far as what is the underlying heart behind what... Uh, the instruction that Paul is giving to Timothy. See, in what, what Paul's going to be talking about today is this issue they were having in, uh, in caring for widows. Now, the church uh, in Ephesus had a system to care for widows, but it wasn't working super well. And there was some confusion on how to properly care for the needs of, the, of widows in their church community. <clears throat> and so every, because every person had a unique situation and being fair and equal wasn't really working. It was sometimes doing more harm than good. And so Paul had heard about this issue, probably, I'm guessing, probably from Timothy. And so he sends this letter as part, you know, this part of the letter as a response to this. Uh, <clears throat> so in verse 3, he starts to talk about this issue. And he says, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. So Paul kind of identifies in his letter three different groups of widows, and then he's going to sort of come through on how to deal with each of these specific groups. So the, the three groups that, that we're going to look at today, he talks about the true widows, he talks about widows who have family that can care for them, and then he talks about what he calls self-indulgent widows. So those are the, these are the three different groups, and, and, and already you just read that much and you're like, oh, this, is, this is messy. This is a little bit awkward, right? And, and I think generally our response to this maybe would be one of two things. When, if, if I was in charge, or if we were in charge of this system, if we had say into this system, probably our response would be one of two things. Either look at the good that it's doing. It's helping people. Yes, I know people are taking advantage of it, but it's helping people. So let's just continue to do it. The other maybe response that we might have is, Ugh, scrap it. It doesn't work. There's people taking advantage of the system. Scrap it. But what Paul encourages Timothy is to meet each person in their unique situation. Meet each person in their unique situation. Now, this is starting to sound a lot more like how families work. This is starting to sound a lot more like how families work rather than maybe how a business or a government works. Because sometimes fairness isn't loving. Helping can actually hurt sometimes, right? And on the other end of it, just because there are people who take advantage of charity doesn't mean there aren't others who genuinely need it. So we need to find a middle ground, and this is where we kind of step into the mess that is family. And I believe, and again, I don't, I'm not trying to make any sort of political statement this morning other than I believe in King Jesus. And this is the thing, is I believe as Americans, we tend to look at poverty as a political issue. 
And we have opinions about how we want our government to handle this very real issue. But here's the thing is I, I don't put a lot of hope in government. I think our government can do great things. Um, and, and our government can, can hold great values and, and, and help people out. But government can't legislate real mercy. Government will always do good for some people and also harm some other people. They can't hit everyone. It just doesn't work like that. And this is, and this is ultimately what I'm trying to say, is Jesus didn't say, I will build a government and the gates of hell won't stand against it. He said, I will build my church. I will build my family. I will build a gathering of believers that are centered around me, Jesus, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. See, the church is a family and families can deal in grace and mercy. Think about the way that you have to, if you're a parent, think about the way you have to parent your different kids. The same thing doesn't work for every, every kid, right? It maybe worked for your first one, but then your second kid comes along and you're like, who are you? <laughs> and, and even you just think about it, it's simply like your different kids, like they want different toys. You probably use slightly different language. You bring them to different events and different things. That they, so that's, that's how a family works. You probably use different methods of discipline for your different kids because what works for one doesn't always work for another. And what you're primarily concerned about is their well-being as a growing human. <laughs> and this is why church family is so important is because we can come alongside one another, not in an intrusive way, but come alongside one another as family, as people who genuinely care for each other and exercise grace and mercy on one another's behalf because we actually care about the individual person because we're all very vital and important in this family. And so, <clears throat> so Paul gives this advice to Timothy. He says, honor true widows, those who are truly widows. And this is this is really interesting. Like we, I think in our culture, we don't always understand the word honor and there's so much more than we can get into this morning. But it, he's saying, think highly of them. Esteem them highly. Those who are truly widows. And this is like very countercultural to the, the time and place that Paul was speaking into. This is, this is not the general culture because widows were like the lowest on the economic ladder. And they were inconvenient to care for. You wouldn't get anything back. But Paul is saying that they should be honored. And, he, and he's going to spell this out again in a few verses. So we'll come back to that. But then he starts to address widows who have family that can care for them. And he says, let them, the family of the widow, learn, or in other words, teach the family of this widow to show godliness now, again, I think the inference here is that these family members are probably believers, but he says, let them learn to show godliness, or, or I think as a family, teach them how to show godliness, and godliness meaning to, to be like God, to, to reflect God's character, to imitate God's character. So let them learn how to imitate God's character by caring for their widowed relative. That's what Paul is saying. And then he says in verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is a strong verse. I, as I was reading through this the first time, they're like, oh, you're, you're speaking on 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading through it, and, and that one like caught me. I was like, oh, that's not like somebody's life verse, you know, that... But this is why it's important, again, and I want us to remember that the world connects our behavior to God's character. The world connects our behavior to God's character. So think about this. What does it say about God if we don't care for our own family? What does that say about God? What does that communicate about God? 
If we cast aside members of our family because they become an inconvenience, what does that say about God? Conversely, if we take really good care of our family, what does that say about who God is? Because when I see who God is, when I, when I look at scripture, when I look at Jesus, man, I, I am very sure that I am inconvenient to love. I don't think it was convenient for Jesus to leave heaven, for Jesus to learn how to walk and talk. I don't think that was convenient. I don't think it was convenient for him to hang out with 12 guys who never really got it. I don't think it was convenient for him to go to the cross for me, but he did. I am a huge inconvenience to God, but it's because of his love that I am where I am today, an accepted child of God. And so that is what we should reflect. When people see us disregard or abandon anybody on behalf of our own comfort, they are not getting a correct picture of who God is. And I just, I want us to understand this this morning, that do, do you know, like, do you truly know, do you understand that there are people in your life who are upset at God, angry at God, mad at God, just maybe just want nothing to do with God, and they have all sorts of mi horrible misconceptions about the character of God and how he feels about them and what he thinks about them. Do you know that there are people that think that way because of people who bear his name and drug it through the mud? Do you realize that there are people in your life who have seen Jesus horribly misrepresented because people have called themselves Christians and then acted like Satan. And I don't say that to be funny. I'm 100% I'm serious. And what people need is they need to see a real and true image of Jesus through your life. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be offended when people are offended. We shouldn't be upset when people get upset because they are hurt. They don't know. They don't know how God feels about them, and how would they know unless we show them? The people of God, the ones who have actually experienced and been adopted, how will they know what God is like if those who have his DNA don't even bear his image? So I, I, it's just my encouragement to us this morning. Let's begin to think about our behavior. And specifically, Paul's talking about how we care for one another. I think this is huge. Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. And I don't know if we always believe that. I know sometimes I don't believe that. They're not, but this is, I think it's significant what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, they'll know you are my disciples by how theologically smart you are, how many Bible verses you have memorized, how much, time, how much you pray every day. All these things are good. It's a both and, right? But people will primarily know that we belong to Jesus by the way that we love because it should be totally different from the way that everybody else loves. And here's, here's one thing, just, just to make a quick aside as we talk about sort of a tough thing. I know there are people here who have made the decision to put your loved one into a nursing home. And for many of you, that was like one of the most agonizing decisions you've ever had to make in your life. And, and I just want to say, uh, you should not feel guilty this morning. This, that is not what this is about at all. Um, because each person has a unique situation. Sometimes medical care needs just go way beyond what you're able to do. So nursing home, I, I'm not knocking that. And so if you were feeling that, I hope, I hope that's not how you're feeling because your loved one is being cared for. I would just say, uh, you know, don't, just don't forget about them. Continue to visit them. Continue to call them. And there's no like prescribed amount for that. <laughs> but I would just say, follow Jesus' advice and and do what you would want others to do for you. And, but I, I just wanted to kind of say that just so nobody maybe was feeling guilty about that or whatever, because again, that may have been the, the very best way that you can care for those in your life uh, who need that sort of care. 
And, and I would just also like to, to add that uh, even, even in a nursing home, if, if, if you have uh, relatives or maybe parents or grandparents in a nursing home, it's an awesome testimony, even just to the other people in the, in the nursing home and, and staff and things there, just to see you caring well for your relative who is still there. That's an awesome testimony. Like, man, this person is getting visitors all the time. Like, there's consistent consistency here with their family. And that's just a huge testimony to Jesus. So, um, all right, verse nine. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation, catch that word, reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So these are, this is kind of, Paul's given a little more definition again to this group that, that we're going to call this morning true widows. They, they, these, are, uh, these are people who truly have no ability or means to, to provide for themselves. And this is, this is the thing, though. As Paul writes about these women, you, you can see this pretty clearly. He's not writing about them as like a pitiful charity case. That is not the sense I get when I read that. He is echoing, if, if you just think back a little bit in the letter, he's echoing the requirements for elders and deacons those who have leadership positions in the church, those we would maybe naturally tend to look up to and and honor and hold in high esteem. So just as pastors and elders are often looked to as examples, Paul is actually setting up widows who are an often overlooked group of people. He's setting them up as pillars of the church. People to be held in high esteem, high honor. People that, you know, younger girls, he's like, look at these women of faith as your examples. And, and these, are, these are women who have given everything and then lost everything. And they continue to give and be the kind of mothers and grandmothers that the church needs. And he's showing their value as women who are truly worthy of honor. And he's helping the Ephesian church and hopefully us this morning to realize something very important that every person is immensely valuable to God. Every person. It doesn't matter how you see them or how offensive or inconvenient or unimportant, whoever, you fill in the blank with whatever person you come in contact with. It doesn't matter how offensive, inconvenient, or unimportant they seem to you. God sees them as valuable. And so Paul is showing and bringing out in the Ephesian church something that's extremely important, which is the value of every person. And specifically in this passage, the value of who these women are, what they have done, and what they continue to do for the kingdom of God and for the family of God. And you just think back to verse 5, right? These are women who offer up prayers and supplications day and night. I believe, I mean, this church has a, has a, has a, a, a long history it's been around for quite a, quite, a, quite a few years. And I believe that the things that we are seeing happen today are a direct result of faithful prayers that, from people 150 years ago. And we can't assume that just because we're here now, it doesn't, this is not about us, you guys. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And so there... Paul, again, is setting up these folks that could easily be overlooked. And especially in Roman culture, it was like, if you were weak, if it was like the weak, just sorry, if you're weak, you just die. And that was, that was the kind of culture that they were in. And so what, what Paul is saying, no, these people are worthy of honor. And to show that these mothers and grandmothers of the church are indispensable part of God's family. And I know many of us are sitting in seats today because of prayers of moms and grandmas. For sure. Even, the, even moms and grandmas who weren't directly related to us. So let's continue in verse 11. But refuse to enroll younger widows, uh-oh, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not, 
So I would not have younger widows marry, bear children, or so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and, uh, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So here's the third group that we talked about. The, the self-indulgent widow. And Paul is saying that these, this specific group of people should not be included in the distribution for widows. And this is where we all go, oh, that's hard. Like that's not a fun conversation that Timothy now has to have, right? Probably multiple conversations. That's not great. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. And I'm sure they were already seeing this in the church pretty clearly, but no matter how well-intentioned, it seems that the church's generosity was actually enabling these younger widows to be idlers and gossipers. And these are, these are folks, you kind of get the sense in this, in this passage that these are, these are people who really probably do have the ability and the means to provide for themselves, um, either by, by working or more than likely getting remarried. And, and I know, again, like the marry and bear children thing, that's might be offensive to some people. Um, and, but ultimately, that was the culture at the time. That was the primary way that a woman could be provided for. And right or wrong, that was the culture. So that's what Paul is writing to. But this was, this was seen to, to, be, to be a wife, to be a mother. That was held in high esteem at the time. Very, that was considered a respected life for women. And so ultimately, here's the real issue that Paul is going after, is that because because of just the, the place in life that these women were at as young widows, rather than being like mothers and grandmothers of the church, they had actually become the town gossips and the town busybodies. Like the kind of people you, would, you see walking down the street and you're like, uh-oh, here comes uh, so-and-so. Or they, you know, they knock on your door and you look out the people and you're like, oh no, <laughs> they're going to come in here and they're going to tell me about everybody else's business and then they're going to, as they're here, they're also assessing all my business and then they're going to go tell everybody about how my house looks and how my kid threw up all over the floor. And, and, but, but everybody, you get the sense from this passage that everybody in town knew, oh yeah, those Christians, stay away from them. Those Christian gals, yeah, they're horrible. They're just spreading gossip about everybody all around town. And again, you guys, this, this is not okay. Paul says, don't give the adversary an occasion for slander. And again, this isn't slander primarily towards us. This is slander towards God. Because we have, we have an enemy that wants people to misunderstand God. That's, his, that's like his whole job. Even from the beginning of the garden, he was like, did God really say causing Adam and Eve to question God's motives. He wants people to misunderstand God. And what Paul is saying is don't make it easy for him. Don't make it easy for him to let people misunderstand God. See, imagine this. In Ephesus, there are Christian women who rather than living what was seen as a respectable life, they just went from house to house collecting and spreading gossip. That's, and how do you think that reflected on God? See, we, we should take this pretty seriously as a church that we should be passionate about God's reputation. And again, I, wanna, I just want to emphasize that this is not about being perfect. This isn't about living a perfect life, never making a mistake. It's about, be, because ultimately like having a, righteous, a self-righteous or a holier-than-thou attitude, like that's awful. Being arrogant, that's horrible. That doesn't reflect on who God is, right? You read in Philippians chapter two, the humility of Jesus, that God humbled himself. So it's way more about being humble and repentant. So I'm sure all of us, right, has caught ourselves gossiping at one point or another. And when I say gossip, what I mean is just talking negatively or complaining about somebody. Have you ever complained about somebody? Have you ever spoken negatively about somebody? You have gossiped. I have definitely gossiped, okay? But here's the, here, here is the thing that we can do as believers. As we grow to gossip less and less, we can ask the Holy Spirit 
to convict us, to reveal those things and start, work it, start to work it out of our lives. And as he does that, what will happen is, yeah, maybe I'll walk, I'll be with my same friends, right? And I'll walk into the same relationship. And generally, you know, maybe I have this one friend and every time we get together, all we do is gossip. It's just, it, this is my gossip f- friend, you know, whatever. This is Jerry gossip. And we hang out and we talk about other people and that's just what we do. Well, maybe I get together with Jerry again and instead of talking about our coworkers, what I do is I find myself start to, Right? I start to talk about Ned, who's just, I don't like Ned. He's annoying. Everybody in the office doesn't like Ned. I'm sorry if your name is Ned. <laughs> and, and so I start to talk about Ned, and then I'm like, hold up, Jerry. Man, I'm sorry. I, I really should not be talking about Ned, about this behind his back. If I really have a problem with Ned, I know that I should actually just talk to him directly. And I, I, I just apologize because I was gossiping. So I, I apologize to you, and I need to go apologize to Ned. Now, what does that say to Jerry? He's like, what? <laughs> who am I going to talk to now? You know, who am I going to gossip with now? And it, what it lets him see, because we, I think we get caught up all the time. I'm like, well, everybody's always seen me do this. Everybody's always seen me act this way. So they're just going to, th- if, I, if, I, if I change now, if I let God change me now, then they're just going to think I'm a big phony. No, that is totally a lie. Have you seen somebody's life get changed? Have you ever seen somebody's life get changed? It's amazing. It just makes you go like, man, I want what they have. And maybe not right away. That's probably going to be awkward to have that conversation with Jerry Gossip, right? But, it, but eventually, he's going to see my life continue to transform, not just in that area, right? But he's actually, maybe he's going to see me actually make amends with Ned. And now maybe I'm the only guy in the office who hangs out with Ned. And they're like, who the heck are you? Ned is still annoying, right? But I'm, I'm caring for him. I'm loving, I'm loving him, not because it's from me, but because it's from God. And it starts to show the way that God comes after even the most unwanted people. And they're getting to see a little image of who God is. And again, I don't do this because I'm this amazing Christian and I, got, I have everything together. It's like, man, I'm messed up. But God is changing me. He's helping me to reflect the DNA that's inside of me. I'm getting a DNA transplant. I'm getting a love transplant. So if you allow people to see your need for God and his changing work in your life, they'll want what you have. They'll want what you have. Now, at this point, Paul makes an important transition in the chapter to talk about how we interact with other people in the family of God. So let's, let's just jump into it in verse 17. He says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit, and do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. See, the, this, is, this is kind of a diametrically opposed sort of thing, right? It's because on one side of the spectrum, as, as far as the way that we would maybe naturally think, right? Widows would be here. The, 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 the folks who, uh, who are inconvenient and, and we, we, if we serve them, we're not going to get anything back. We're not going to get anything in return. And then Paul makes a transition to folks who maybe we would generally tend to think on the opposite side of the spectrum of folks who we actually expect a lot from. People who we could get something from. People who we want things from. People who have leadership positions and power. And what he says is, just like you're to honor widows, he says, honor elders. And in fact, what he says is they're worthy of double honor. And This verse may be uncomfortable for you. I think for some people it is uncomfortable to hear that because I think generally as Americans, and it's kind of just, we're constitutionally this way that we don't like the man. We want to, we want to rebel. We want to get our way. We want to vote on it. You know, we like, that's, that's how we, we sort of have this rebellious spirit, right? Like that's just, that's America. That's, that's what we have inside of us. And so when we think about leadership, we don't generally think about Um, honoring them. We think a lot more about what are you going to do for me? And if you don't do what I want you to do for me, then forget you. I can find a different leader I like better. We do that. Every four years we do that. 
And th- so this is, the, this is the thing, is that I want us to understand what Paul is saying. He says, those who have devoted themselves, and this is, this is a point, those who have devoted themselves to our spiritual well-being are worthy of double honor, not double trouble. And I think we get it flipped a lot in church. And I just, again, I just speak as, as somebody who's grown up as a pastor's kid. I see many, many, many pastor's kids actually walk away from the church because they've seen how the church has treated their parents. And that's not okay. Even, even for my own dad, I've seen him get, t- get taken advantage of time and time again. And the only reason that I don't have a chip on my shoulder against the church is because of the way that my dad handled it and the way that he brought us back to the feet of Jesus in the midst of it. And I'll, honestly, in a lot of ways, my dad just wouldn't tell us about a lot of the junk that went on. Because if he did, I probably wouldn't be standing here today because I'd be out there all bitter and angry at the church. And so what, what we are called to do is actually to hold up those who have committed their lives to our spiritual benefit and not, to, and not that we have to just blindly follow and just accept every, that's not what I'm saying, but honor them, hold them in high esteem he talks about letting in, letting in, like not muzzling an ox when it's treading out grain. Like let, let, the, mo- let the ox enjoy its job. It's got to tread the grain. Let it at least eat some, right? <laughs> let pastors and elders enjoy what they're doing. Don't make it horrible. And again, th- th- these are people who have invested themselves in us and have literally turned, turned away from all these other things they could be doing in life for your benefit for your spiritual benefit. And so again, this is, it's just about being a family because a lot of times we see pastors and elders not as a part of the family, but as people who are, it's like, how am I going to, how are you going to feed me? How are you going to support me? How are you going to help me? And let me tell you, Pat, your pastors and elders, they want to come alongside you. They want to, they want to feed you. They want to, they want to help you. That, that, that's their heart. That's why they do what they do. But just because you can't always get exactly what you want doesn't mean that you should cause all these problems and trouble for them. And there's a way to honor somebody and disagree with them. That is, that's just the case, is that you can still honor somebody and not totally agree with them. And you can disagree gracefully <laughs> and lovingly. That's okay. See, Jesus didn't say that his entire church would always agree on everything, right? But he said that we should love each other. So just like we want to love those who are maybe, uh, maybe tend, to, tend to be who we would consider people who are hard to love, people who are inconvenient to love. And again, I'm going way beyond just, just widows, but anybody who's just difficult for you to love. We should also love those who maybe we expect things from. And in that way, operate as a family. So in verse 20, he continues, as, as for those who, persi- who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Again, you know, not, <laughs> not a life verse for anybody probably. But, but again, just think about this. Like this is, this is something that we are called to do as a church, to come alongside and care. And I, and I like the, I, I mean, I don't love, I'm not going to say I love the word rebuke because I, <laughs> this kind of seems harsh, but this is what rebuke really means. It just means to convince with solid, compelling evidence or to expose. Just to expose the truth. Lovingly bring truth into somebody's life. Help them to see the error of their ways. It doesn't mean condemn, Okay. Rebuke does not mean condemn. So that's what, that's what we are called to do as a, as a family of God, and specifically Timothy as the pastor and leader of this church. He's like, man, as you see people that are hurting themselves, hurting other people, and hurting God's reputation, you need to come alongside them and rebuke them. Again, not condemn them, but come alongside and lovingly convince them as best as you can in prayer, that what they're doing is not okay. And this is how, and this is where we're going to wrap up. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging 
doing nothing from partiality. Now, in, in the book of James, James also addresses the issue of partiality. But this is the thing, is that in the church and in our family and really just in the world in general, we do not get to assign value to people. We do not get to decide what a person's life is worth. Because here's the, here's the reality. You just think about it. A thing is worth, let's just say a painting, right? A painting is worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. That is how we, dis, we, that is how we determine the value of things. What somebody is willing to pay for it. What was God willing to pay for you? What was God willing to pay for that person who maybe just pushes all your buttons? That guy you see across the road who's dressed the opposite of how you would dress? Or that person who, you, who lives right next door and they are like always getting, like pushing the buttons with you as far as like, oh, I want, like I'm trying to push my property line. I want to build a fence. I want to do th- all this stuff. It's like, you know what? I don't get to assign value to that person because God already signed the value of his life to that person. That's what they're worth. So often as humans, we, de- we define value by what somebody is capable of or by how much ability somebody has, by what they are able to offer society or me. <laughs> and the reality is, is that is not how God measures value. He says, I created you. You are valuable enough for me to send my son for you. That is crazy. That is, honestly, that is way off the grid for me. I still don't fully understand that, and I don't think I ever will. Even in heaven, I'll be discovering more of what that means every day. God, the, the amazing hugeness of God's love for the people he's created. But I just want us to, to see what, what, um, what he has said here, what Paul has said here. So let's not have, let's not give love with partiality. Let's not have prejudice in our hearts against anybody, but let's give freely like God has given freely so that other people around us can see the life of Jesus through us. So to wrap up this morning, just two things. Number one, let's be passionate for the name of Jesus. As a church, let's be passionate for the name of Jesus. Let's be mindful of what our actions tell other people about the character of God. Because if I'm thinking about that, even if I make a mistake and I'm thinking about God's name and how it reflects on his reputation and his character, I'm going to respond a lot differently when I make a mistake. Maybe as a parent, when you make a mistake with your kids, maybe, you're, maybe you just end up uh, saying something out of anger to your kids. And you remember that you are a reflection of their father, God, to your kids. And so you're like, oh man, I need, to know, I need my kids to know that their father, God, never gets angry or harsh with them in that way. He doesn't lash out in anger. Okay. And then you can come alongside your child and shepherd them and help them to see God as he truly is. So again, let's be passionate for the name of Jesus. That's number one. Number two, simply this, love your family. Love your family. And I know that's broad, right? Because first of all, maybe you have, maybe there was something that was pricked in your heart. Maybe you have, maybe you have family members that you have kind of pushed aside. And again, maybe it, maybe it's an an elderly person in your family who just become an inconvenience to you. And you realize that, and God has kind of pricked your heart about that this morning. Maybe, maybe it's like somebody in your family who you just don't see eye to eye with. Like literally you don't agree about anything. If you share your opinion, you're pretty sure they just say the exact opposite thing just to make you mad. Maybe you've, maybe you've just kind of Maybe you, maybe you haven't like totally cut yourself off from them, but you know you hold them at arm's length. You don't really let them in. You don't really care about them. You just kind of like tolerate them. Maybe, maybe God is convicting you this morning that you need to lean into that relationship. And no, maybe you won't see eye to eye on everything, but you can care about them. 
You can love them in practical ways. And love your family as in, let's love each other here. Man, if people come in and they, they feel like, man, this was, I just sat in a chair. If that's what people feel when they come here, honestly, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be here then. And let me just say, I have experienced amazing, amazing love an amazing community, an amazing sense of family here. Personally, I have. And so I just want to thank you personally for that. And, and I know that we can continue to grow. We can continue to do better. We can continue to become more and more and more like Jesus and the vision and the image that he has, what he imagines when he thinks about his family. So would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that, first of all, we can pray to you as Father because you've adopted us as your kids. And we want to take seriously the, the, uh, the, the charge that you have given us to, to reflect your name well. And we do that primarily by loving the people around us and specifically loving those people here in our church family. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would enable us to do that supernaturally well. I pray that when people attend this church, that they would see that this is not a place we just come and we sit and then we leave. God, I pray that we would actually invest in one another, that we would care for each other, and that our community and ultimately our world would see your goodness through the way that we love and care for each other. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.